And I just want to tell you all to get ready for perhaps some fisticuffs among three curmudgeons that we have on the panel. Uh, we started out with a, a rather raucous uh, discussion uh, based on something that uh, uh, Clark Hoyt, the public editor of the New York Times, uh, wrote, published uh, April 11th, if you're interested in tracking it down. It's called The Danger of Always Being On. And it speaks to this new environment of new platforms and uh, the fetish for speed uh, that the profession of journalism has always been involved uh, with. Um, I first heard that phrase from, um, Bob, you'll remember this, from a professor I had here, uh, Scott Cutlip, who not only taught public relations, but he was probably the world's best copy editing instructor. Uh, people would go into his copy editing labs and break out in a cold sweat thinking they had made an error. And that's the first time that I ever heard the phrase, if your mother tells you she loves you, check it out. So has, um, has there been a change in verification? We're not sure, uh, but we've sure got some interesting uh, uh, perspectives on it. Uh, you know, we can go back to the, to the war of the world's television program when the United States was panicked, thinking Martians were, were coming. Uh, we can go back to the days of yellow journalism when the uh, American public thought that the Spanish had indeed mined uh, the battleship Maine in uh, Havana Harbor, and, uh, and, and, and off we went. Where was the verification in all of that business? But uh, I just want to give you just a brief introduction to, uh, uh, to who you will be hearing from today. Uh, the biographies, of course, are in your packets, but um, uh, Kristen uh, uh, says that uh, verification has become more difficult uh, across all platforms. You wrote that some of the time. Uh, and she indicates that um, a tweet often serves as an interesting role in providing breaking news from people on the scene. Interesting. Uh, John Smalley uh, is a curmudgeon of the old order. Uh, he is concerned about errors no matter where they happen, how they happen, on what platform. Uh, Phil uh, generally uh, is willing to think that uh, tweets could be a good tip sheet. For those of you, you wrote that. I, it's a direct, yes, it's a direct quote. <laughs> Trust me. I can verify it. You think you can. I know I can. And I know that my mother loves me. Uh, and Phil also says it's, it's, it's good to be first, but it's better to be right. Now, Sue uh, sees journalism, journalism can be a process. Uh, and I, I'm fascinated by something I'm, I'm hoping you're going to tell us about, and that is uh, verification is something that people value in this research you're involved with, particularly in the new media, but, but not in the way we traditional curmudgeons might expect. So I'm hoping you're going to talk about that a bit. Uh, Scott uh, says, uh, can we afford to take the time for verification when news today moves at the speed of lightning? And Certainly, uh, Scott does not think that the tweets are journalism. Now, Clark Hoyt uh, kind of uh, got our conversation going because uh, he showed the underwear drawer of the New York Times, which has taken to doing a regular video newscast of its, uh, of its news meetings. And uh, for those of you who have ever been involved in a news meeting, there's a lot of speculation and what ifs, what about, how abouts that go on during the news meeting as we talk about how we're going to make the news presentation for the next day. There's a lot of speculation that goes on. So that's a pretty dangerous, uh, a dangerous thing. There's a couple of, of comments that were made offhandedly that came back to bite during the news meeting that was videoed and presented to the public. Uh, factual errors that came back to bite the New York Times, or at least embarrass them. But um, 
two particular things. Um, we had a reporter who was in Japan covering the uh, Toyota debacle. Uh, she was frustrated with how Toyota was uh, not putting out information, and in a tweet, uh, she told her tweet followers, Toyota sucks, uh, which caused some embarrassment. And then, uh, showing that April Fool's Day is nothing to be trifled with, uh, we had uh, uh, one New York Times uh, reporter, David Goodman, uh, who uh, fell for uh, a, uh, a prankster who said that he had been declared the official White House blogger. Uh, and then another reporter by the name of Andy Newman thought that he had a trustworthy source. He thought he had a trustworthy source. So uh, he published an item about a street theater group about a thousand of them that would be traveling the New York subway system on uh, April 1st, uh, naked from the waist down. That did not happen. So we started looking at these things and talking about them and uh, got a little conversation going among ourselves. But what I would like to do is to, is to start off, and uh, we'll start with Kristen, uh, because you know the first question I'm going to ask. Uh, why, why in the world would a conference on ethics in journalism include such a bedrock, bedrock subject to journalism as verification? And uh, following up on that too then, uh, Kristen, if you'd talk a little bit about, is there, do you think, if in your experience, is there less effort being given to verification in this so-called era of new journalism? And if so, give examples from your experience. And Scott, if you'd share the mic, that'd be great. Okay, well, the first thing when I got invited to do this panel, and I have heard the title was, Whatever Happened to Verification in Journalism? My thought was, something happened to it. Because um, in my daily life, I guess I don't experience necessarily a huge problem with verifying things. I mean, it's something that I've taken as a basic of closer. Is that better? I don't know what I did. <laughs> Pull that thought, Chris. Help. Pull that thought. <laughs> Sorry about that. I hope you don't have any embarrassing pictures here. Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. So, um, I guess I, I mean, I, it's just something that I do as part of my job is I verify information. And to some degree, I think that there may be a perception that there are verification issues because mistakes are more prominent in some ways online versus the old way of acknowledging mistakes in like a print newspaper would be a quick page two, we regret the error that some people might not even read and be aware of the mistakes. So I think there is a more awareness of the mistakes that are out there now, but I'm not sure that there's necessarily more of them. That being said, I think there are some pressures with new media and technology and the internet in the sense that um, there's a 24-hour news cycle with cable news, 24 hours online, and I think that does add some pressures to getting things out first. And I guess one example from my daily life, which was really small, but it was something that it struck me before I was invited to do this, was a couple weeks ago there was a big story in Madison. I'm the city government reporter for the Capital Times, and there was a big story about the Central Library. Um, there was some talk, I think, on a Tuesday that the new central library might not be happening, but there was going to be an additional negotiation between the developer and the city on a Thursday. And on that Thursday, when I was at work doing something else, I saw a tweet from another journalist from um, one of the TV news stations saying, basically, the deal was dead. The city's moving on with um, the city's moving on with the, a, re a renovation plan versus a new library. And I just hit the retweet button, thinking this is a journalist that I generally um, generally respect and think that he does a good job, but then as I thought about it, I'm like, I didn't call anyone about this, I just hit the retweet button, I'm like, after I did that, I'm like, I shouldn't have done that, this is something I should be making calls on. So I think there is, I guess, that pressure sometimes to get things out first or to sort of chime in with a me too, and I think that's, I guess, where the potential problems are, so. Thanks. Scott, your thoughts on this? Make sure you eat the mic. Okay. 
All right. Um, I don't think that verification has gone away either. I think that we have more uh, tools available to us to verify things than we ever have had before, and I think we use them, and I don't think that discipline has eroded all that much. But I think what's happened because of not just the, the need for speed, which we also have al always had, but the need to push content out there, which is driven not so much by us, but maybe by our owners. Um, the process is open for all to see. Um, so the New York Times webcasts its editorial meetings, which I didn't realize until I saw that article. Um, what a great opening for inaccuracies to get out there, for lack of verification. It's the process. Uh, the other day, um, on this, uh, a blog that all of us in TV news read when we should be working called TV Newser, uh, there were a couple of items in succession, and the juxtaposition was kind of delicious. At ABC, uh, at uh, 1.41 p.m., ABC News completes its cuts, 350 to 400 jobs slashed. A couple hours later, breaking news drill causes ABC Twitter slip up. They had to retract a tweet. Now, it's a little cheap shot to marry the two, but I thought that was interesting. But what happened to them was this. They were apparently doing a drill for how they were going to report the, um, the Supreme Court pick, uh, the next Supreme Court justice. And the drill got out as a tweet. Breaking news, uh, President Obama will name Elaine Kagan, Elena Kagan to the Supreme Court, Jake Tapper reports. Jake Tapper then immediately follows up and says, no, I don't. <laughs> now, all of this normally would have happened in, in the context of the newsroom. But because we have to push out this content, um, it happens before our eyes, and inaccuracies get out there, and that's a problem. Um, an interesting thing that happened to me a couple of weeks ago, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pass this on, um, as you'll remember, there was an incident where um, uh, the Qatari diplomat was flying from Washington to Denver. Um, they thought that he was going to be a shoe bomber, and of course, alerts went out to every plane in the sky, and one of which I happened to be on. Um, I was flying from Dallas to Newark, and um, we couldn't you know, use our phones or anything as we, we were informed of all of this. But of course, be, being, you know, wanting to get the, story, the news out there, wanting to do something, as we all have felt, that great adrenaline rush that's one of the reasons a lot of us do this. Um, as soon as we landed, I, as soon as they let me, I took out my Blackberry. And luckily, I didn't tweet this because what I, what I told the desk, hoping they would verify it, was, uh, and if I had tweeted it, it would have been something like, on flight from, uh, from uh, DFW to EWR, pilot says there have been two hijackings, um, and we have to keep everything in our laps, otherwise, uh, off of our laps, otherwise they'll divert the flight. I mean, clearly that's not what happened. And clearly if I had tweeted that, it would have been accurate, but it would have been wrong. I mean, it would be accurate in that the pilot said it, but it would have been wrong it set off enough of a panic on my own desk and on the NBC News desk, think of what would happen if that had gotten out there. Um, so I would just encourage everybody, and particularly young journalists, um, avoid the temptation to just put the process out there. There's a lot of satisfaction in finding the facts, verifying them, and then reporting them. And I will say here and now, and I'm happy to debate this, tweets are not journalism. Journalism is a reporting of the facts based on an editorial process. If a reporter tweets something, that circumvents the whole process, and it's not journalism. Next. <laughs> How do you really stand on that, Scott? We're, not, we're kind of unsure, but I think I saw a little fire light up in Sue's eyes. Um, well, I do. I do a lot of research, and um, I interview journalists across the country, and I also just finished a, a giant study in our local town here, Madison, where we had sat down with a bunch of Madison residents, um, actually <laughs> about 100 uh, Madison residents, and we asked them about social media and what do you think about all this, and unfortunately, 76% of that sample believe that the tweets are journalism. 
um, of journalists, right? That's different if they read a tweet from their friends. They only 46% of those think that that's journalism, right? So the problem is, is there is a disconnect between what the industry is hoping um, the audiences are believing and what the audiences are actually believing. But what I was referring to in the pre-conference email um, that was referred to earlier was that what was, was interesting is they know that it's not always verified and they, they understand that and they approach it um, with an understanding that they're just looking to get some immediacy. Now that doesn't mean that they then don't take those tweets and then retweet them or it's more Facebook posts and, uh, and comments under news stories and comments um, that they see on other blogs and their citizen journalism sites and what they're really interested in is um, news right, news that they can use to find out more news. And so this was a common theme in all my interviews. They were interested in news that allows them to dig deeper. And I was going to read this quote from one of them, and it was um, from one of these citizens, which, I, which was a dominant theme. And these citizens were older, younger, um, middle class, lower class. They were the superintendent uh, to people who were completely disengaged from news. So we did a stratified sample of the entire community. And this one um, said, I will look at the news and it is a very basic story, not really expanding talk to the problems of our town. I feel like there is a lack of participation. It all feels so unfinished. So I figure I can at least take my base knowledge and put it up against what I read online and then look around and start making a comparison. And that's why I go to blogs. So when I say that um, they're still interested in verification, but they're taking on more responsibility and more willingness to do that work themselves, which I found was a very startling finding to me because especially the people that I was inter interviewing, I figured they'd be a lot more traditional in that. And so um, I wanted to mention that and I'll just throw one other statistic out there, which is a national statistic but was um, backed up and um, mirrored by, my, by the local sample, which is that uh, almost 40% of these residents, and nationally this is true for Americans, have contributed in some ways to news creation. So I, as, as I mentioned in the pre-conference emails, um, I th I'm starting to think about tweeting and Facebook posts and sharing of emails and commenting and all that as being part of a very public news gathering process that now citizens are part of. Um, and so that verification happens within that pro process. That doesn't mean that journalism, the verified articles and everything that comes afterward isn't as important, but that there's now a new part of that process that needs to be considered. So Sue, so if, um, if there is concern about tweets being a valid news medium, and let's use the traditional value of news medium, are, are news organizations um, uh, sticking their own fingers in their own eyes by the, by the promotion of tweeting and Facebook and all these social media activities? Uh, are we diminishing our own uh, traditional news product by that? What is your research? Uh, any, any thoughts on that? Does your research touch this at all? Def definitely. Um, actually, and this is what I teach in my classes, I feel like if journalists are not in these spaces, they exclude themselves from the conversation. And I feel like journalists are the ones who have the training and understanding about um, primary sources, um, true research, that they can step into those spaces and provide some kind of a, a you know, verification process within those spaces, but they need to be present and they need to be using them in the ways that their audiences are using them. And they're not right now. John, uh, has there ever been a, a, an error in the Wisconsin State Journal? <laughs> Funny you should mention that, Pete. <laughs> Actually, I, I meant today, and I, I forgot as I was coming to the, to the Fluno today, I, I meant to bring along a, a copy of my newspaper from this morning, and, and I wish I had it. Well, I, I imagine if this is me holding up my, my paper for today. I think we got one. Yeah, well, I, I imagine it's right here in my hand, and I would probably say, as much as I hate to, to tell you this, there, there's probably an error in here today. There, there's probably a mistake in here today. Uh, and, and I don't know where it is, and, and I hope that there isn't, but, uh, and we, we do our best every day, all day long, to make sure that there isn't, but I can probably say with some certainty there is a mistake in here somewhere. Uh, and a, a long time ago, I, I heard a fellow talk at a conference who said that uh, any newspaper that doesn't run a, a pretty uh, regular and, and hefty list of corrections on page two or wherever they uh, appear in a, in a newspaper is, isn't A, being honest with themselves and their audience, or, or B, just isn't paying attention. 
Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of humans working on a, on a complicated process every day, and there is human error, and there are mistakes that occur, uh, despite all of our, our really uh, genuine best efforts to, to prohibit that, but it, but it does happen. I wanted to, to go to a couple things, if I could, just quickly, and the first one, I was actually going to save this uh, till the end. It was going to be my big close, but I'm going to go to it right away now, <laughs> because it, it speaks to Peter's question of why at a conference uh, like this is the topic of of uh, verification and, and that sort of thing even on the agenda. And what I have here, and I, I hope you would indulge me uh, just for a second, I have, it's the spring issue, uh, many of you are probably familiar with this, uh, I hope so anyway, it's the spring issue of the Wisconsin uh, People and Ideas uh, magazine put up by the Academy of Science and Letters. And it's a wonderful, wonderful magazine that I enjoy a lot and I, I think it's a great piece of work and I, I'm not bringing it up today to, to bash them in any way. But, and I hope that you all read it and enjoy it as much as I do. But it just so happened, just the other day, uh, coincidentally, I was reading uh, the, the editor's notes, uh, the intro column by the editor of the, of the publication, and it just absolutely sort of did to me what the uh, tweets aren't journalism uh, uh, thing does to Scott. And the editor is, is writing about how, again, the, the title of the piece was tweeting for content. It really wasn't about necessarily tweets, but it was them trying to describe their mission, the Academy's mission, in a, in a 140 character uh, synopsis, and that's where the tweet reference comes from. But he, anyway, he wrote that he was talking with a friend of his who works for the Boston Globe, and that they went on to talk about his job, and this led to a larger conversation on how the print newspaper industry is struggling to compete in a fast-paced multimedia environment. This struggle, he noted, is no secret and has much to do with the internet and the rise of nonstop cable news channels. I agreed, pointing to how objective news coverage is suspiciously absent these days, and the fact that journalism jobs are an endangered species. The majority of small communities can no longer rely on a print daily or even a weekly to keep them informed about what's going on in the world, no less their own community. I would submit to you that's flat out not true. That is absolutely not true. And, and my point in this, there, uh, it's a twofold point in, in bringing this up. And number one is that I think some of the premise of the, whatever happened to verification and the sort of parenthetical is in this always on deadline, fast paced, hyperactive environment that we're all operating in now. And, and does that make it harder? Well, this is, a, this is a publication that, again, comes out four times a year. It's a quarterly publication. So there's not a fast paced, hyperactive, tweeting the news all the time around the clock environment associated with this. But yet there's, I, I think, a flat out misstatement of, of reality in this, in this piece. And, and the second part of it, of my point, would be going to Pete's question, why are we talking about this? I think it is this sort of piling on uh, element and, and sort of broadly stating uh, a state of affairs that, that may or may not exist as, as a fact leads people down the path of, you know, nobody's checking facts anymore and everybody's just slamming stuff up as fast as they can slam it up. So anyway, it really got under my uh, skin, as you might have realized, and I, I think that it, and again, this is, like I said, it's a great publication, high ideals, I'm sure a very uh, high, well-read audience, but I worry that that well-read audience reads this and thinks, oh, I guess he's probably right about that, and, and it's just not true, uh, and I'm not sure what it was based on. Uh, and I'm endeavoring to track down the author just as soon as I possibly can and have a conversation, hopefully over lunch with him about that. Uh, I, the other thing I wanted to mention, and then I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to to Phil, in preparation for, again, for uh, the conversation today, I have been talking with people in my newsroom about this and then also reached out to a couple of colleagues uh, around the company in, in Lee Enterprises. And one of them is a fellow named Mitch Pugh, who's the editor at the Sioux City Journal in Sioux City, Iowa. And Mitch was very recently involved, and his newspaper was involved in a APME, the Associated Press Managing Editors Association. They did a, a project on ethics and credibility of breaking news online. Uh, again, I think speaking a lot to some of the issues that we're talking about. And in the end, they, they uh, engaged uh, a lot of citizens and, and community leaders for discussions about what the expectations are and, and uh, how to go about doing that in a responsible, reasonable way. In the end, Mitch and his team came up, they actually have a, a policy, a newsroom policy on breaking news and how they handle breaking news, uh, which I don't think, frankly, many newspapers have a written policy about that. We have 
we have all sorts of uh, policies in our newsroom, but we don't have one that speaks specifically and directly to that issue. We might, and maybe we need that, but, and we'll consider that. But in, in discussing the exercise that they went through with Mitch, one of the points that he made, which I really agree with and is sort of fundamental, I think, to would be my position, that, again, the idea that we, we haven't changed standards, we, we can't and shouldn't and won't change our standards uh, in the sort of new world, if you will, but what changes is the decision-making timeline and the, and the process involved in making those decisions is what has really changed. And in the sense, you know, he, he mentioned to me that we, you know, in the newspaper business, we've always been in the mode of reporting what we know as soon as we know it. But, but again, in a traditional model, we've only done that once a day. We would do that once every 24 hours in the traditional model. Now we're, we're reporting what we know as soon as we know it, and we're doing that all the time, uh, sort of consistently. And so uh, it, it just, I think, again, it's a matter of having those needed, necessary conversations and that vetting process going on uh, many, many times a day, as opposed to maybe at the 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock news meeting to nail things down at the end of the day in the more traditional model. And, and the last thing I would mention, I also spoke with our, uh, our Vice President for News, Joyce Daly, uh, the Lee Enterprise uh, at the corporate office in Davenport. Um, we had a conversation the other day and I was engaging her on this specifically as well. And, and I, again, she made a comment that I thought was also really on point for me. And, and she said that really our, our future of our, of our industry is really, it's dependent on people realizing that we still have core journalism values uh, and, that, and that includes very much verification and that there are a lot of new challenges, yes, but we also have all sorts of opportunities for developing new best practices and, and dealing with those new challenges. So uh, I, I would kind of hand it off to Phil at that, I guess. Actually, John, if I could just jump in, as, as much as it pains me to correct you, uh, the tweet was invented decades ago in the newspaper business when we used to put out extras. Yeah, the, the original tweet. The original tweet. Phil, how are things in Chicago? How are things from your well, perspective? Well, I, I was just going to say, you know, Chicago's like everywhere else. I mean, we have a lot of people, so we have a lot of people who are following in a lot of different ways. Uh, but it's, it, the, the issues we're talking about here are common regardless of the city, regardless of the place. I, I'll ask I, you I to speak into that mic, Phil. If I, you will, I will try, okay. counselor. Um, I, guess, I guess what I'm, uh, you know, you mentioned the conversation we had briefly on, uh, in, on the internet with uh, emails, and at the time I was trying to monitor that and do my job, which had me very distracted, so I didn't quite remember what I wrote. I, I, I take it on faith that the email you got from my address was in fact written by me, but you made no <laughs> attempt to check it. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, and the, part of the reason I was a little testy is I, I sort of feel as though I had to get my, my arms around this. The, it seems to me verification is less an ethical issue on the face of it than a quality control issue. The ethics come in, comes in in the fact that we have a good faith uh, relationship with the, the people that consume the, the news we put out. That when it comes from a source of credibility, from a reporter with a, with a reputation, that you can rely on that information as being verified true and not just our notebooks thrown up in the air and said, here, take it. Um, so a tweet, I think, actually in some ways can be news if it's, if it's properly vetted. I mean, I, I use tweets sometimes uh, after I've written a story to note that I've written, that there is a fact out there, it gets the fact out there, links to the story in depth, I think that's journalism. I think it's a it's a platform by which I can I can spread information. Um, you, uh, Peter mentioned you know uh, the quote he heard was it Cutlip you heard it from, you know a mother says you, she loves you check it out. I'd always heard that attributed to City News Bureau of Chicago. I don't know who said it um, originally. If I were writing it and I were going to attribute it, I'd make sure. Now I know that's where you heard it. I just don't know the original source of the quote. It seems to me half the quotes in, in, in America get attributed to Mark Twain and the other half get attributed to Ben Franklin. And sometimes it's the same quote. And, and one of them is, and I think this is Twain, but I, I, like I know. Uh, so if you're out there, you'll crowdsource it for me. Uh, you know, the, the line about how a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth gets its shoes on. I don't even think I got the quote exactly right, but you get the idea. And, and one of the things that can happen with uh, 
with the internet, with uh, tweets, with, with all of that, is if you make a mistake, if I get grammar wrong on something that I've put out, because I, I blog, I, I, and I blog news, I don't blog opinion as much as I blog news, uh, people will tell you, people know. Um, in the past, you wouldn't have the access to that kind of instant feedback and you know, course correction, and, and that's actually very useful. You hope to God you don't make a mistake. You feel awful when you do. You have an obligation, again, part of the good faith relationship you have with consumers to, and, and your audience to correct it as soon as possible. And if it's a prominent mistake that you feel has been distributed on a, on a, you know, and repeated somewhere, then, then I think you, know, you have an absolute obligation to point out that you corrected it because otherwise the, the, the bad information gets out, it muddies the water, that, you know, there can be two versions of the same story floating around in the, in the ether and, and no one knows which one is the correct one. Uh, but you know, this, this isn't new, this predates Twitter, it's just, it's just everything is now faster. Uh, there is a premium on being fast. There are only two ways that you can, you can mark a story as your own now, because everybody's story gets out there, whether it's the story from Madison or the story from Chicago or Milwaukee or any other publication or blog or you know, site of, uh, that's considered to be trustworthy, and that's either to be first or to be distinctive or both. And so being first, it's, it's like the old days of uh, AP and UPI. You know, when the Kennedy assassination happened and Merriman Smith was close to the phone, he got to call in the lead first to say shots rang out in a motorcade in Dallas. Newspapers all around the world pinned that version up on their, on their wall and then built the story from that. AP, the guy did a good job. I mean, he, he, he won a Pulitzer, I think, later in his career. He got beat that day on the first paragraph, and as a result, that story became UPIs. And Smith, mm -hmm. I think, won the Pulitzer that year. But again, I could be wrong. Please fact check. I'm working off the top of my head here. All I can tell you is, you know, I, I've been through too many disasters on cable television where Baba Booey had a role in, in what made it happen. Uh, I think there are processes you've got to follow to be, you know, it, it, to be good to your audience, to be good to yourself, otherwise you're no longer valuable to anybody. And, and you know, we all have to be careful. The more prominent our, you know, our institution, the more prominent we are. Uh, the more damage you can do with the mistake. I mean, CNBC makes a mistake and it moves markets. Uh, Google picks up the wrong story, for, you know, a, a, a years-old story about United Airlines uh, It says they're going into, you know, they're going to file for bankruptcy. They're not. Okay, let me just say that they're not. They're maybe merging with Continental, but they're not going into bankruptcy. But it was an old story. It somehow got into the Bloomberg feedback and their stock dropped like a rock before anybody could explain, oh, how did this, ha this is a computer glitch, how did this happen? But it's because credible information gets into the, you know, gets into this mix and if it's wrong, you know, there's, there's a real price to pay because it can spread a lot faster than it could in Mark Twain's day. Now some of those are, are errors of fact or error of processing, uh, moving content. But let's talk a little bit about, about the ethical process. Um, I don't think, in my understanding of my almost four-year connection with this school, um, until the uh, Center on Ethics arrived here, uh, we didn't have a specific uh, 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 study course on ethics, although it was considered part of our curriculum here at Wisconsin. Uh, but. Um, uh, Let's kind of talk about you. This panel here have all been working journalists or are working journalists. Who do you look to in your organization? Uh, who are the people? Is it yourself? Is it other people? Who, who are the ethical touchstones that you use in your newsroom or in your career or in your work? Who, what? helps keep you in touch with, with, an, eth uh, with an ethical pursuit of your reportage. Uh, go ahead, Christy. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I don't have a really interesting answer. My ethical touchstones are my editors, as well as um, more experienced journalists that I work with. I mean, I conference with them regularly about issues that I have and stories that I reported. So. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have a much more interesting answer than that. I mean, uh, I have a, a managing editor, uh, relatively new with her organization, but there was one, there always has been one, you know, that, that is, is good for bouncing that sort of stuff off of. Some of it is your own discipline that you develop over time. Um, things I learned here, things that you you just learn over time about, um, you know, instincts about uh, about verification, about you know, reporting what you know, and so on. Um, so you know, uh, should there be such an ethic in a, in a newsroom? Should there be that sense that that ethics is a living, breathing thing that we need to do, or is it just we just assume that as a matter of course. What kind of a priority do we give to it? What kind of an emphasis? Do we ever do, we ever do for example, uh, in your newsroom, Scott, do you ever do an after action review, an after, you know, an after uh, uh, situation analysis of what happened? Do you talk about it like that? Um, well, I mean, I work in the crazy world of cable news, and so we're, we're constantly going, and there isn't a lot of time, as much time as there should be, to, to do sort of after action things, because we're on to the next thing. Uh, but yes, it absolutely should be. I can't say that it that it is always happening because, uh, and again, particularly in the area of cable news, which has been so infected with opinion, um, you know, it's hard to separate them. But in the as far as the actual journalism goes, um, uh, absolutely, it needs to be part of the the conversation. It needs to be part of the just sort of the mindset. And and, and you know, and it's not all that complicated when you get right down to it. Ethics and journalism are reporting honestly, telling the truth um, as best you can as best you can do it, being fair, which there's a lot of things that attach to that, but if you if you start from that basic basic point, it all should flow from there. Does it always? Of course not. Okay. So I um, I guess I would like to throw in another player here, which is the audience. And uh, in thinking about the audience as the ethical touchstone as much as our colleagues and uh, media watchers and uh, the academics and whatnot, and uh, and so um, because when when I talk to people, they you know they do consider tweets from journalists uh, journalism, but but what they mean by journalism is different from what they think about in terms of a news article, right? They think about a news article as being you know having these sources, and they think of that as very credible, and um, but their expectations of Facebook posts and comments and tweets are all different than what they are when they approach a news article. And I think um, we need to start thinking about audience expectations in terms of what do the audiences want those standards to be in those realms um, as much as what does the industry want the audience to want, uh, basically. And uh, the other thing that I um, might mention is Dan Gilmore, I don't know if you guys know him, he, he came out with that We the Media book a few years back, and he's come out with a couple books since. Um, he's now at ASU. Um, he used to be over at San Jose Mercury News as a columnist, and he's coming out with a third book now. It's called Media Active, and in that book, he's going to propose a credibility scale, and he's talking about it from the citizen's perspective, right? I mean, that we need to start teaching media literacy at a fairly fundamental level in the elementary schools, in the junior highs, and understanding what is a tweet, and what is Facebook posts, and what is all of that, and I think the audience has an ethical obligation at this point, too, as much as journalists do, to understand what kind of medium are we talking about in terms of the values associated with that medium. So I'll just put that out there. I thought the credibility scale was really kind of interesting. John. You know, and I, I had lunch with, uh, with Stephen a while ago when, as a, when we first came to, to meet each other, and, and we talked about how, again, in a typical newsroom, the, the ethical dilemmas, uh, again, they just they don't ever stop coming. I mean, every day we're, we're faced with them, and again, if I could quickly uh, relate a story. I mean, literally, yesterday and today in my newsroom, we've been bound up in a very difficult situation, and I was actually thinking of it when, when John was doing his uh, sharing on that uh, terribly difficult thing that, that they went through, but it, this is a, sort of a much smaller scale than that, but a local story, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a promo and a, and a quick advertisement for our Sunday newspaper, big package on heroin. Uh, and, and heroin abuse and, and the plague of heroin in, in our community over the recent years and, and what a uh, literal killer it has become. And over the weeks and weeks of reporting, one of our, uh, one of our reporters has been dealing with a, a number of sources, one of which is a, uh, a heroin addict who goes to a clinic and gets methadone all the time. We, we went to the clinic. We had permission from the clinic to go to the clinic 
talk to people, shoot, shoot photographs, but, but not identify anybody by full name or by face uh, in photographs. And uh, we did that. In the process of doing that, we come to know one of the women who's there who says, oh, I don't mind if you use my name, and I don't mind if you show my photograph. I want to tell my story. So we work with her further. We go to her home, and we, we photograph her, uh, and, and, and the photographer and the reporter collaborate to create a wonderful probably three or three and a half minute maybe uh, uh, audio visual slideshow for the, for the web that uh, you know, has her narrating her story with photographs and, and video clips. And meanwhile, the uh, counselor at the, uh, at the clinic is very worried that this woman's unduly exposing herself and, and, and going to put herself at risk and all sorts of other concerns and works with us, tries to you know, convince us to back off. We work with the, long story short, Today, the, the heroin addict, the woman, uh, tells us that she's thinking now that she doesn't want to use her, her picture and doesn't want to have her face shown. And so, but yesterday, we're having a discussion. How do we make these decisions before she'd come to that conclusion? We're dealing with, do we honor the request of the drug counselor who says you shouldn't do this, or this 22-year-old woman who says she's fine if we do it? Uh, and what, what degree of sound mind is she in at that point in making that decision? And we talked literally yesterday about Bob Steele and the Pointer Institute's guiding principles, which are you know, boiled down to three very uh, simple but very deep uh, concepts. You know, number one, seek the truth. Number two, remain independent. And number three, minimize harm. And, and we talked about that yesterday. And again, the, the unfortunate circumstance we often find ourselves in seeking the truth and minimizing harm are often like this. It, it's, it's very difficult to have one without the other at times. And so that's the, the corral that we, uh, that we bounce around in. Very good. Uh, get ready for your questions after Phil's comments. Uh, we'll turn to uh, the social media team and to, and to you in the audience here and, and uh, take your questions. So Phil, over to you. I'm just imagining the tweet from what he just said. State Journal editor says, big package, heroin, coming Sunday. <laughs> Um, well, I, I mean, that's how it happens, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, cutting, you're cutting words out to make it fit 140 characters, and the critical, the critical uh, two-letter word gets knocked out. Um, you know, I, I think ethics come from you. I think ethics come from within you. You have a core set of values. An institution has a core set of values. So long as you, know, you understand them, I think it's important. I've always thought, though, that those, those core values with regard to an institution uh, directly tie to the audience. I don't think that's new, and I don't think that changes, because ultimately, their judgment of whether you made the right call, you can be academically sound or, or legally sound ethically, uh, but if you print that woman's name and something horrible happens to her as a result, and the Wisconsin State Journal gets tarred with that, you'd better be very sure of the reasons you, why you did it and, and make sure it wasn't just because you were afraid that a reporter was, you know, that people might think it was Janet Cook all over again and that someone had made up this person. Uh, you know, and that's, and that's where it gets tricky. The audience will always hold you accountable. It's become easier to do it because we're all linked together and can re respond to one another more rapidly than we used to. Um, I know when I hit an ethical dilemma, and sometimes you just want to make sure that what you think is correct. And sometimes you want to make sure that not only what you think is correct, but the people above you agree that it is correct, because they're going to hold you accountable if, if you're not. Uh, so it, it can be your editor, it can be other editors, and, and you mentioned the Pointer Institute, I'm sure also Steve here, Stephen here at, at the university. If you have a real ethical dilemma and you want counsel, it's out there. You can get it. And it doesn't ha necessarily have to be in your newsroom. Um, but it should be someone who understands what, as, a, as a, a, an institution and, and as a reporter, you're up against. So I, I think that's where uh, ethical, you know, you, you, you come into this with your own moral compass. And, and it's very much, I think, like, uh, you know, like a doctor. You know, we're on call all the time, too. And, and, and it's first do no harm. You know, be sure that what you're doing is right and accurate and, and fair and uh, as complete as it can be under the circumstances. Uh, I know that people have different expectations of different things, but you know, you have to go to the, to the you know, it only takes one or a dozen people to say, 
Well, they may think that, but I believe this to be the case. I'm going to hold you accountable to the highest standard. So the highest standard, you know, you have to make the judgment of how much capital you're willing to risk on something, you know, that may or may not be worth it. Phil, let's go over to uh, Katie and see what came in from uh, the outer world. <laughs> You guys are really struggling with what to call this. Okay, uh, why are you focusing so much on the means of distribution and deciding what is or is not journalism? Isn't it about the reporting and the writing and not about whether it arrives in ink, waves, or bytes? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the reason we're focusing on it is because that's how it's been presented here. Uh, and, and I think what, what a lot of us up here are saying is that nothing really has changed. All that's changed is the speed of media today has changed. The, the methods of interaction with the audience have changed. But the, the basic core values, the core ethics, constant. Bob Drexel up in the back. It's on. It is and if you'd identify yourself. Yeah, I'm Bob Drexel from the uh, Journalism School. I actually would like to hear the panelists address uh, ver uh, verification in a, in a slightly different way. And by that I mean verification of what government officials, politicians, policy makers say. Let me take the, uh, probably the, the too obvious example. Um, a well-known politician says that the proposed health care bill has a death panels provision in it. We immediately read stories about the death panels. Death panels take on a life of their own. What is the ethical obligation of the journalist in reporting that kind of story uh, to step in early in the game, very early in the game, and examine the, to verify, if you will, the accuracy of those kinds of allegations? Because that kind of pass-through journalism has gotten journalists, if not the country, into a great deal of difficulty uh, more than once in our history. The, the, uh, the obligation to check it out is every bit as, uh, it, it's right there with checking out your mother telling you that she loves you. Um, the problem is that there's so much out there, there are so many, I mean, the, the death panel thing came from, I believe, from Senator Grassley, I mean, it came from a politician. Um, and. And so you have to run, you know, run this weird tightrope between, you know, he, report, he said this, it's a senator that said this, there's some assumption of, and probably maybe there shouldn't be, there's some assumption of responsibility on his part, integrity on his part, and yet you do need to, to verify it, and sometimes it's not that easy to verify it quickly. And because, again, our, our process is so open for all to see now, a lot of this is done in real time. And, and the, the point has been made here a few times about media literacy, and that's the real disconnect here, is that we have this process that's playing out in real time. That's not bad. The fact that there are, the fact that there are tweets out there, uh, that's, that's information. It may not be, you know, full-blown reporting, but it, it's, it is information. And we all should look at that, but, you know, we're all putting it together in real time. So, uh, so yeah, you, gotta, you, you have to verify it. Sometimes it takes time. And, and the, the consumer, I think at this point, is still pretty ill-equipped to, to synthesize all of that. That's the danger. Okay. I'd just like to add to that, because I, I thought that was really well articulated. Um, I would also like to say that um, it's, that's why I think it's so important that some of this social media become uh, essential to part of the information flow process, right? Because um, just as those tweets can become inaccurate, are, are inaccurate, just as quickly they can be corrected um, within that process in a much faster way than they are in the newspaper. Um, just looking at the live blog from this conference, you know, somebody would, would retweet something that was said up here. Uh, somebody would uh, take a perspective of what that person had actually meant, and then we'd have a debate on the live blog. No, I think actually they meant this. And then you know, we come to consensus about what was actually meant by that. And it was just this whole other conversation that was happening that was separate from what was going on up here. And um, I think sometimes we can forget that just as much as Twitter or Facebook or whatever social media platform you're using can uh, be inaccurate, it can also be a vehicle for correction um, uh, and, and debate. You know, death panel was a catchy phrase. And the audience ran with it. Uh, the facts were out there. 
people either chose to embrace them or they didn't. It's like the Obama uh, birth certificate. People still do not believe that, that he was born in this country, that he's a legal American citizen, that he has the right to be president. There can be stories in every paper in America every day, and there will still be people who believe that. And, and, and that's, that's the way of the world. And, and what's changed with Twitter, with the internet, with everything else is, it's much easier to sustain uh, a small, you know, an, an opinion or an idea that may or may not be factually accurate. But let's not confuse that with, with you know, media and media institutions and, and responsible journalism. Wendy, uh, you, oh, uh, Lee, you've got a question. Hi, Lee Wilkins, University of Missouri, and I think I want to follow up on what, what Bob started, because one of the um, statements that's come up a lot is that, is that standards of journalistic verification haven't changed. So in helping Stephen pick a fight, um, I want to say that they have. Uh, and I think they've, they've changed on, on both ends of the continuum. So I'm going to go back to the, the uh, case study from earlier. Um, when I was a journalist, which admittedly was shortly after the dinosaurs died out, um, if I had been covering a police story about a murder where the family agreed that something had happened, the local authorities agreed that something had happened, um, uh, you know, witnesses agreed that something had happened, that would have been enough for me to go with this story. I would not have felt compelled to seek a photograph. But I think one of the reasons that we do get compelled to do that sort of thing is because on the one hand, we want a standard of verification that almost will hold up in court. Sometimes that will hold up against court. And that's a very high level of proof. On the other hand, we have an audience, I'll bracket it with this anecdote, um, I was at a public meeting the other day, college educated woman said the following, I never watch the news, it's all bad. If there's something that I really need to know, my friends will tell me on Facebook. Um, and I was thunderstruck. So I, I guess I'd like to, to get you all to respond. What is the level, you say there's a level of verification that hasn't changed. Please tell me what that is, because I'm confused. Let me jump in on that one. I had one anecdote that I wanted to share, and maybe it, I think it's illustrative uh, of where I think and hope that, that my news, newsroom is at. And believe me, I, I could share a, a, a bunch of other stories, quite frankly, where, again, we, where we, we biffed it and, and we didn't do our due diligence and we, and we put something in the paper, again, hopefully not today's, but we put something in the paper that was not accurate. But here was an example of, and I think it gets to your point, and gets to the point of what hasn't changed, and it, it touches a little bit on the politician thing as well. Uh, again, in, in uh, grilling my city editor, uh, Phil Brinkman, for some examples of what we do and, and what's worked and what hasn't worked, he shared this one with me. It's a familiar story for everybody in Wisconsin, and he said, uh, when we got an email from Barbara Lawton's campaign last winter that she was dropping out of the gubernatorial race, we held off posting that breaking news until we could confirm that it wasn't a spoof since it seemed like it was so out of the blue. As a consequence, we were beat by WIS politics and by the Journal Sentinel, probably by my friend Bill Leaders up there at, at, at Isthmus and, and maybe everybody in town. Uh, Phil continues on, even though we could see the return address on the email, speaking to, to Phil's earlier uh, point uh, only partially in jest, uh, Phil, our city editor, was concerned that there was too easy, it was too easy to fabricate, so he insisted that we speak with a reliable source first. As he recalled, it took more than an hour to confirm that. And meanwhile, again, it's up on everybody else's uh, website before that. And again, not saying that we always do that and not saying that we haven't made mistakes and we haven't uh, leaped when we shouldn't have leaped, but I think that's a good example that gets to that point of what hasn't changed is, again, not accepting at face value and, again, in the new technology, understanding that it is easy to get spoofed and, uh, and, and we're just exceptionally careful. Anybody want to jump in quickly before Wendy takes the question over yeah, here? Yeah, I, ju I just want to add on the verification oh, thing, I, the, okay. what hasn't changed. I don't think that what you're describing is that different from the way it's always been. You want to seek the highest level of, of proof you can, and then you, pu you make a judgment whether you have enough, and you publish on the basis of that. If you have all those people on the record, you'll go with it, and the picture would help because if there are any questions about what happened, it would be nice to have that to be able to hold up and say, well, we didn't necessarily publish it, but we do have this photo. It's just, it's just one more bit of documentation. And as for the other person, there have always been people who didn't keep particularly well informed, and that's not changed. 
And the only thing that's changed in any of this is that we're all more aware of it because we're all linked together more, you know, intricately and more, uh, you know, quickly. I have a question and it relates to the prior question about the role of stenography in journalism. Okay, Senator Grassley or whomever said death penalty first, but we have insurance companies who are a type of death penalty because they will deny a procedure or a treatment. And in the case of other areas, uh, there's reason for, historical reason for the government of Iran to distrust the United States. And this is the kind of thing that never seems to make it context. It's what, in what regard is context part of an ethical responsibility of journalists? Um, I mean, that's, that's part of accuracy. Um, the, the part of the problem, particularly in that area, was that, that people have, and politicians have gotten a whole lot better at using the media. They're more comfortable with it than they ever were. I'll give you an example of, of context. I covered Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans uh, from the very early days, um, the, the, the day that the, the levees broke. Uh, and the mayor came out and said, we, we need 10,000 body bags. Uh, there are going to be 10,000 10, deaths here. Uh, that was, you know, that, that took off like wildfire, 10,000 dead in New Orleans. The thing that immediately jumped to my mind was the experience of covering 9-11, when they said, there are probably 10,000 dead here. And so the context and the way that, that I reported it was, bear in mind that these initial estimates are usually wildly inaccurate, but this is what the mayor is saying. It turned out that what the mayor was saying was inaccurate, you know, and there was a piece of information that was out there. But yeah, context, context is huge and it gets really tough in an unfolding situation, but it doesn't mean it's impossible to, to get it in there. I sense there's some additional questions out there. We're now moving into the tight telegraphic and terse responses to questions to move along. Wendy? Steve Berry with the Iowa Center for Public Affairs Journalism. I've heard a couple of times that uh, from the panel say that the, um, the verification standards have not changed, that it's just that the process has. Um, I teach journalism and one of my favorite teaching tools is to take a website news report and put it up on the screen and we analyze it and then we put a printed version of the same story up and we analyze it and compare the accuracy. So obviously there's two different processes going there. The, the website story is almost always not as accurate as the printed version. So my question to you is, can you really honestly say that the verification standards have not changed, just that the process has? Does it the process eventually infect the verification standards that we hold dear and true? The, uh, the wire story was always less accurate than the history book. I mean, there, there's, there's just, the process has speeded up. I don't, I, I agree, I don't think that the, the verification standards have changed. It's just that more of that process, as I keep saying, more of that process is out there. I would, I would concur. I, I think the issue to me, I would suggest is, it, it's less about the accuracy on a, on a straight up factual basis of the web story, but the completeness of, of the web story is always going to be lacking uh, than is the print version the next day because there's another 12 hours of reporting that goes into that, that print story the next day. And that, that web story, what we're trying to do is unfold web stories, again, as, as we can over the course of the day. And a, and a, a story that's up on our website at 8 o'clock at night you know, might be the 14th version of that story. Uh, that's, that broke at 8 in the morning. And uh, so at any point where you put your finger on it and say, well, this isn't accurate, you know, again, if there are flat out factual errors in that, I would, you know, I, that's absolutely uh, worth calling out and saying that's not right. And, but I don't think that's the case that happens most of the time. I think it is, it is simply the, the completeness isn't there because the process, again, of, of the reporting process hasn't fully played out yet. Yeah, I mean, the comparison I would make is the, the wire story first lead and the, first, the 14th lead right through. Uh, and sometimes, though, I, I would also say 
from my own experience, the web version ends up being much longer and more complete in a lot of cases because there's a limitless space and to address things. The, the difference being that the, the print product tends to be a little more polished. Uh, that, that's going to happen because more people get their hands on it. It's a different pro that's a different product, but the, but the actual facts, uh, again, speaking for myself, you know, if there are mistakes, we fix them. We fix them as soon as we can. And if it's something that, that's significant, we point out that we fixed it. We've so, got, I don't know. Sorry, Phil. We've got two well, questions in the queue. I just, I, I just want to add one thing, though, um, which is why not think about the news article, and depending on which platform it is, from a verification continuum, just as uh, Gilmore's talking about a credibility skill for audiences, you know. So just as the history book has a verification over here, the tweet has a verification over here, and in its place comes transparency as a priority standard as opposed to, and then that we move as we get to um, uh, the website article and then to the news article. I mean, I think that's sort of where we're going. Um, it's just a matter of getting everybody on the same page. I just want to jump in, though, and I think there's actually a little bit of a conflict in that when you talk about the credibility scale and being transparent that you're not, your tweets might not always be as accurate as your stories, but then if you're acknowledging that and you're setting a lower standard for your tweets, doesn't that also compromise your credibility as a reporter? That you're saying, I'm not going to verify this I don't, I, I don't think journalist? you're saying you're not going to verify it. I think you're saying this is what I know at this moment, but it's but this information is what it is right now, and I'm going and I'm continuing to report on it, and I'll continue to update you as I get more information. You I mean, know, I think you know, that's. I mean, you can be more complete. Obviously, I mean, I guess I would just hesitate to say I'm not going to be as accurate, and I mean, you might not have all of the information, but that's different from not being accurate. Sort of what John mentioned. You could so, do that, but then you're letting everybody else have the conversation without you. I mean, and then everybody else is putting forward their inaccurate statements, and at least you're, you know, working the story in a way that other people are just sort of retweeting. But what's to say that why, why do we have to be saying stuff all the time? I mean, just let them have, you know, let, the, let them have the conversation. Let's, let's wait and get it right. That, that's what I don't get. That's why, you know, I mean, and again, not to disparage anyone who tweets, but that's why I don't want to do it. But, but because I, I, I want to, I want to make sure I got it before I say it. Well, and Sue, you know, I, I, I'm all for media literacy. I, I'm a big proponent of it. I think we need to build a curriculum in our schools, starting in preschool, and work all the way through. But I, at the same time, um, I don't know that I want to see the decision on whether something needs to be accurate or as accurate as possible to the audience. I think the responsibility is on our end to do what we do. That's why we're not, I mean, that's what makes this difference between professionals and, and non-professionals, or, or really, truly, journalists between, between journalists and people who just write what happens. Right. I completely agree, but why not use social media for part of that process? Put it out there. This is what I'm looking for. Does anyone out there have any information? And more often than not, somebody does. Well, but you, you then have to vet the information. Sure, and, of and, course. And, and, and that was the question I had with your, your, the ethical thing. There are a lot of things, especially ethical issues, that I don't know that I want to uh, you know, ex introduce publicly if, if it can be resolved without doing so. Because you know, we're responsible for what we print. We're responsible for what we put on the air. We're not responsible for what we don't put in public. I, I once had to give a deposition in a case, and they said, well, well, did this person tell you anything else? And I said, well, what we printed is what we were comfortable with, and that's what we we're going to stand by, and the rest of it is just work product. And that's really the, the criteria we're talking about here. I want to say, I don't think, I, mean, I wasn't trying to say that journalists, I don't think, should be involved in social media, because I think they should be. I just think that because there's so much information out there and so many people out there with, and voices that are inaccurate who aren't journalists that it's become even more important for your credibility as a journalist to be accurate as a, to be accurate on these forums I guess and, and, one, and using it as a, using it as a reporting tool is great you know we've all I think used whether it's Facebook or message boards or whatever to find sources but using it as a platform, if you don't have it, that's what I'm not comfortable with. Well, if you, if you don't have it, no, but it's a, it's, it is also, though, a good way to get news out. If you have it there's, and you want to get it out fast and it's interesting, you put it on Twitter, you put it on Facebook, and people pick it up and retweet it and spread it with their own, uh, you know, pushing your link around, and it, it does wonders. It seems that the issue of to tweet or not to tweet is somewhat unresolved 
as our as our panel winds down, it it uh, just uh, uh, underscores the reason why Stephen Ward, in his infinite wisdom, put this topic on the agenda. We never had a doubt, Professor Ward, and uh, we want to say thank you to the panel. Oh, excuse me. We, we, we did have one more. Might oh, make, I beg your pardon. Might make a nice closing oh, okay. mark for all of you guys. Very good. Uh, <laughs> okay, it's not the way it has always been. What has changed? For instance, do you see information from press releases getting into news outlets unedited? What are the consequences, the ethical consequences to 40,000 journalism jobs lost? Um, I just wanted to, I mean, I think that's a good question in terms of the job loss, and I think that's, I think that's what um, I think you were talking about earlier in the question about context, is I think a lot of times the context does get lost. I mean, if you're putting a press release out, even if you acknowledge, hey, I just got this press release in my email, and people know it's a press release, I mean, I don't know, there is just, there is less time for context gathering, and there's less institutional knowledge at a lot of journalism outlets right now, and I think in some ways that does have an effect even if you're acknowledging that the information is a press release that there are some issues with that. Yeah, I think it, the question veers off from the from the peer verification question in, into the larger context and certainly the industry has been been diminished and, and the again the, the total amount of, uh, of offers to the to the audience out there has been reduced by by losing that many jobs in the industry but again I would advocate that, that that doesn't mean that we're, again, shoveling unedited content into the newspaper or onto the website or, or onto mobile uh, or anywhere. I, I think uh, it, it, it changes the, uh, the, the overall, uh, again, the volume and, uh, and some of the things that we can do, but it, it doesn't, uh, isn't a given then that that means that we've lost our verification. I, I think it, the, the job losses are, are tragic and uh, you know, I would never, I, I'm obviously not in favor of them, but at the same time, we're able to do things now technologically with the internet and everything else that it would have taken a team of reporters to do before. Um, it's not as bad as, uh, as it might be. Do press releases, does, does news sometimes get out there unfiltered? Probably more than it should, but it always did. Part of the reason that it gets out there unfiltered is because there's so much unfiltered content getting out there. Um, but it is, as, as you said, the issue of uh, you know having institutional knowledge, be, putting it in context. We deal with press releases and, and uh, alerts from companies all the time as a financial network. Uh, and the best, you know, sometimes you have to report it as is, but you you need to have the context and put it in context and to put it in perspective. So there is, uh, you know, with fewer journalists and and. Out, news outlets sort of reining in and, and trying to figure out what kind of market they can own, less things are getting covered. And that's just, that's just the way it is. You'd like to think that the things are still, that are still getting covered are getting covered well, but you know, that was, that's always sort of a hit or miss thing on a human basis. I, I, and just also workload because there are fewer people. The thing I would say about um, you know, the other part of it, the biggest risk is that the internet is a level playing field and if we cede the high ground by compromising standards, then every bit of content takes it, its own, you know, the same level of credibility. And everybody with a website can put out a press release and get it into Google and it becomes part of the information mix. And that's part of what I'm talking about with regard to the, uh, you know, the bad information can get out there a lot faster and a lot more pervasively because of the technology. And I think that's part of what's changed. And, and you know, the only related thing I would mention is there's a paper or, paper or a series of papers out in New Jersey, I believe, that are pulling hockey coverage from the hockey team. They're, they're taking stories and they feel that it, it, they're absolved of, of responsibility for, for just printing what the, what the team puts out. Uh, by labeling it as such. And I think when you, again, when you see the high ground of, you know, what our standards are and what our brands represent and what we represent and, and, the, and the standards we uphold, then I think, um, you know, we're, we're going to have a lot more than 40,000 journalism jobs lost. Thank you very much. Thank you.